This is God's word. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. I'll be reading from the NIV. You may follow along in the Bible or on the projection. Hear now God's word. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Hey, good morning once again, and uh, welcome to our new all-church small group Bible study series that we're kicking off today. How many of you are already in a small group? Just sort of curious. All right, that's pretty exciting. We actually did a count last night. Most of us are already in small groups, and if you've never been in a small group, this is a great time to begin. Uh, It's something that we're going to do together as a church, and I'm really excited about it. And it it comes from a a course called the Gospel-Shaped Worship Book. Can we, oh wait, I didn't plug it in, huh? These things usually work better if you plug them in. Um, let's see, can we, can we try again? It can happen. Yes, all right. Uh, can you kill the light for a second? So if you've never seen the, yes. It, it, Anyway, the one day we have brightness in the wintertime, this is it. But anyway, it's a gospel-shaped worship, and uh, I'm really excited that we're going to go through this together and to launch this seven-week sermon series that corresponds to this seven-week course. So the purpose of this series is quite simple. Uh, It's right here. What is worship? Right? This is the purpose. What is worship? And... And to kick it all off, we're going to begin with the most foundational question. Uh, We're just going to focus on that question. So why don't we do this? Let's bow our heads together as we kick off. And let's ask God to sort of guide and bless this time together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this is your time. And we ask that your very presence, uh, both through the Word and through the Spirit, in our hearts, minds, soul, and strength, uh, just come upon us. And may we, in proper response to you, both uh, uh, learn how to and commit ourselves to worshiping you fully. So thank you, Lord, and I pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So, um, quite simply, the purpose of this sermon series is to empower corporate worship, which just means all of us. We are the corp- We are the body. That's you know, and this is all we're going to be doing: uh, learning how to uh, to worship together. So. What is worship? What is worship? What, what word or what words or ideas come to you when we use that word worship? For many of us, uh, worship usually begin, becomes identified with what are really the elements of worship. That's good. Uh, that, nothing wrong with that. So for a lot of people, think, uh, we think of worship in terms of singing. Any, anybody do that? For you, the primary way of thinking of worship is singing? Anyone? Maybe. Uh, for other people, worship can be a time of quiet meditation, right? It, it goes on. I mean, it's all these different things that go into worship. Others might think of worship as sort of a feeling. And this is why some people, I think, when they go to especially very beautiful places like uh, a national forest, um, we all of a sudden get this feeling. For me, it's, it's always been uh, the ocean. It's, um, it's not the... You know, this is the Nantucket Sound. It's a painting of the Nantucket Sound. For me, though... I think the the closest I ever came to feeling like I was in this natural uh, outdoor cathedral was one night I was crossing the Nantucket Sound to get to the Nantucket Island, and it was just, it was a dark night, and all of a sudden, right above me, the whole Milky Way was out there. There's no other light. It's it's just complete darkness. And I remember looking up thinking, boy, I don't know if I'm ever going to feel this way again. It's hard to capture, so I just thought I'd put up a painting of the the sound. Um, You know, sometimes it's, it's... 
things that, I don't know, it's go, it goes beyond words. So what is worship? Really, what is worship? As it turns out, worship is more than these elements. It's more than singing. It's more than praying. It's more than these things. Jared Wilson, who is the person who writes the material that we're going to be going together to get, uh, to, uh, for the next seven weeks, explains in the Gospel Shaped Worship book, which is that book, this is the definition of worship. It's very simple. Worship means to give worth or value to something. Let's read that together, shall we? To give worth or value to something. It expresses what we find most valuable or satisfying. That's, that's worship. That's what really worship is. Worship is rooted in the word worth. That's what the, uh, the word comes from. And indeed, worship is a shortened form of the word worth-ship. And we just sort of skip over it, and, and that's how we get the word worship. It means the state of having worth. And so that's what worship is, uh, just at the most basic level. So again, I, you know, what is worship to you? Simply put, then gospel sh- gospel-shaped worship should be about us, therefore, intentionally giving worth and value to God. Once again, gospel-shaped worship, real worship, should be about us, all of us together, intentionally giving worth or value to God. Worship is very important to God. Um, the word worship itself is mentioned in one form or another 243 times in God's Word. Praise, another word that we sometimes associate, uh, is mentioned one form or another over 300 times in the Bible. The word sing, just the phrase, sing to the Lord, that's what we like to do in worship. 47 times it's mentioned. Just that phrase, sing to the Lord alone. So you get the idea. God is very interested in worship. Your worship, my worship, our worship together. And as we will see in a few minutes, worship ultimately is you know, therefore about loving God. This is why the, uh, from the very Old Testament days, the very beginning, God commanded us. It's not a suggestion. It's not a request. God actually commanded us to intentionally worship Him. But here's the thing. Here's one little thing. In all instances of worship, the point is not simply to have humanity make sacrifices. Those are the elements of worship. Or to sing songs. Or to gather an assembly. In all instances, when we go and read what the Bible tells us, what we see is that all worship really is more than just the elements. It's actually training the purpose of worship as we lift up worth and, and value to God. It's all about God training us to, to therefore receive His gift as we lift up our gifts to Him. It's really, it's, it's a reciprocal relationship. That's how God's treating us. He's, that's what worship is. He is saying, now let me show you how to receive and give. Receive and give. And of course, the greatest reception and gift is something that we just celebrated just a few weeks ago. It's Jesus Christ. So, Starting from the Old Testament, all of worship, what the purpose of worship, all the way extending to today, if you think about what it's about, it's really God's way of training us to receive Jesus Christ. And that's what it is. That's the good news. And, and from the beginning, all of what we know of as the Old Testament, as well as the Old Testament, it's just giving value and worth to God in various different ways, leading up to and culminating in Jesus Christ. Call it what you want. Um, God originally called this the divine covenant. Uh, He now calls it the church. Now in the New Testament, we are all here to give value and worth to God because we are appreciating Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit that lives among us. So this is what it is. Worship in its true state is, is meant to be a beautiful exchange. So, worship, the giving of worth and value to something. How does that jive with you? How does that jive with you? How does that jive with what you think of and what you sort of like to think of as worship? Just think about that for a second. The giving of worth and value. Does that jive with what you think of worship? I ask this because I suspect that this definition of worship may come as sort of a, sort of a surprise. Something we might not have been expecting. Maybe we did. Because nowadays, far too often, the common view of worship revolves around what we do as opposed to to whom 
and for whom we do these things on Sunday. And as I said earlier, what we do to worship in activities like singing and so on, they actually sort of take on way too much importance in the hearts of people. And we lose focus. And we forget about the giving of worth and value to God. And, and, and when that happens, we start to reduce worship. By the way, uh, I'm, I am the worst sinner in this area. I'm just as guilty as anyone when I do this. Uh, um, um, when I lead, wor- for me, I mean, I love singing. If, if you know me at all, I love playing the guitar. I love singing. I, lo- I, I love to sing and lead worship. But even for me, you know, when I'm sitting up here, sometimes I, I get caught up in everything but giving worth and value to God. You know what I think about? So you ever wonder what praise leaders, you know, we, we worry about, come on, sing louder. You know, and so sometimes it comes out, right? It's not just me. Sometimes we say, come on, let's all sing. You know, and that's good. Encouragement is good. Um, but, you know, are we giving value to God? Are we giving worth to God? Uh, sometimes I, I worry about, I want to sound like the CD. I even want to look like the CD, you know, the video. You know what I mean? I'm 51 years old, and I want to look like this 25-year-old guy with bandana on. You know, praising God, sounding like this, you know. And, and, and I forget, I'm supposed to be leading us in worship. And I wonder, like, do I add value to God when I'm doing this? Probably not. You know what I'm saying? Worship, to give worth and, and value to God. We, 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 we do things... And it's easy to lose that focus. Now, why am I making such a big deal about you know, worship and what's good worship and what's bad worship? Uh, what I'm going to say is a big point. Um, and it's all about inauthentic worship. And the reason why I'm making a big point is, and what I'm going to say is actually quite painful to hear, the reality is when we look at the Bible, when, whenever God encounters inauthentic worship, God is not bored. Say this again. When God encounters, you know, kind of inauthentic worship where it might look good or you know, maybe we're distracted or trying, God doesn't get bored. Actually, for God, that's not his, his reaction because what God actually sees when he sees inauthentic worship, and that's why I'm making such a big case out of this, is he actually thinks, and he actually calls it evil. When we worship and, and we sort of dial it in or we're distracted or we're more worried about what we want, and the reason why I'm making such a big federal case out of this is God's word is very clear. When God sees inauthentic worship, he says it is evil. Uh, listen to what he says. This is a God rejecting hollow worship. This is from Isaiah chapter 1. And God says, stop bringing any meaningless offering. So, Offering is one of those things we do in worship. Your incense is detestable. This, you know, some churches, even today, they burn incense. It, it goes way back. So what are we seeing? God is saying, it doesn't matter how well you bring offering or how big an offering. It doesn't matter how beautiful or how precious the incense. In other words, the elements of worship themselves, in and of themselves, don't add up. If something's missing, that's key. New moon, Sabbaths, and convocations, he says. Think of it, you know, what's, we don't do new moons. It, it, it's, it'd be the same thing as God says, Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's, all those things. He says, I cannot bear your evil assemblies, your new moon festivals, and your appointed feast. And here's the thing, my soul hates. Why? He ends by saying, uh, uh, they're a burden to me, and I'm wary of bearing them. Israel's sin is not that you know, they're not doing a good enough of job. It's not that the dancers, they used to sing before the Lord in those days. You know? yeah, and they used to dance before the Lord. We don't dance mostly today, but they, we still sing. The job wasn't that, you know, the, the problem wasn't that they, were, they weren't singing well enough or uh, or that the dancers weren't great. I bet you they were the best dancers in the country. I bet you they were the best singers in the country. But Israel's sin was that rather than authentically worshiping, 
she began to use and prefer the action of worship to cover up the, the heart that wasn't fully there. And so God lists all the things that he rejects, all these things. And what God's telling us to humanity is that on their own, all these things are meaningless. So, painful, right? Painful. There's a, some deep implications for us. You know, what God is saying to us is, I don't care how you worship, in that sense. You know, it's not how well you worship, or even. But he's, he's asking fundamentally, where's your heart? So how can we really worship? How can we offer worth or value to God? In today's main passage from Mark chapter 12, Jesus does something. He explains true worship, how to give worth and value to God. So uh, for the remainder of my time, I want to spend my time focusing on what Jesus is saying here. Now, Jesus, when he offers this, he responds not to a question about worship, but there's a, a, a scribe, who's, think of it as a religious leader in Israel, who originally asks a question of Jesus that has nothing in his mind that has to do with worship. The scribe is asking a totally different question. Right? Follow with me here. The scribe's question is simple. The scribe comes up to Jesus and he says, Hey, Jesus, I heard you know, you're important. What is the most valuable commandment? What is the highest and the most important commandment? So what scribe is expecting is he just wants Jesus to tell him what's the highest thing so he can go do it. But Jesus actually answers that question by telling us that, in essence, God's commandments are not to be divided. And there's a reason why he does that. Let's look at this. Um, this is what Jesus actually answers. He says, and this is a verse that we all know. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's a principle that Jesus is laying down here about God. So he begins by saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, which I'm going to tell you means it's, he's not to be divided, he's not to be chopped up, he's not to be made into you know, convenient bits or parts that we prefer or enjoy. The Lord your God, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength. And the second is, love your neighbors as yourself. And he says, there is no commandment greater than these. Now, again, stick with me, but the two commands that Jesus chooses here, in essence, he, he's talking about really the entirety of the law. Verse 29 or verse 30 has to do with how we treat God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, your strength and, and, and mind. Verse 31, how we treat others. Love your neighbors as yourself. And what Jesus affirms is that just as the law is not divided but whole, because that is a reflection of God, in essence, our entire existence doesn't get chopped up. We don't get to chop up life. We don't get to chop up the bits that we want from God into, well, I like this, but I don't want to do that. In essence, what Jesus really says to the scribe is, you ask a question about, you know, what's the most important law? Jesus says, don't you understand? Your entire life is worship. Just as God is one and His commandments are one and you can't chop those things up, don't you understand, scribe? And by the way, Jesus actually likes to scribe. He says, but don't you understand your entire life? You should love the Lord your God with what? All your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. That's the entire person. And he says, that, all of it, is to reflect that unified oneness of God, the oneness of the Word, and the oneness of the way He's made you. And, and the human, all of human expression, your entire life, is supposed to be a, a worship. Let me say it again. Just as the law is not divided but a whole, the living expression of the law as a person is that the whole life is a worship. So that's how Jesus gets into this, this, this picture of what really worship looks like. He's not interested in doing this better or, or trying this more or, or this effort. He's saying, take your life. And the way you value God and lift up value to God, in essence, is simple. Our whole life is worship. 
Just think about this for a second. Just kick back for a second. Your entire life, there is not part of your life, as we are followers of Jesus Christ, your entire life is a worship. That's pretty both neat and challenging to me. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are to love God with everything that we got. And did you notice, this is the exact opposite of what God says to Isaiah in that chapter about inauthentic worship, where he says, no matter what you try, no matter what you bring, no matter what effort you make, as long as your heart is divided, as long as you're chopping, trying to chop me up and make me into, you know, I don't know, pieces that are easy for you to deal with. If you can't accept that all of it, your entire life, is worship, then, then you're wrong. The exact opposite, Jesus, you know, the good news, Jesus lays out for us is, the good news is our entire life is to be a life of worship. Now, you might be thinking, well, I'm not really that much into worship. <laughs> you know, gee, that's a lot. I mean, your know, entire life is worship? Uh, maybe perhaps you're thinking this because you're not a follower of Jesus right now. Or even as a Christian, you might be thinking, you know, worship is something that you might want to do in its own time, and you don't want to do this whole thing. But here's the thing, and this is where, again, Jared Wilson uh, points this out really well. Uh, Jared Wilson points out, and you'll read in the book, that worshiping is not something we have to be taught to do. It's not an extra. I'm going to say that again. I, again, it's a little bit of a surprise. But nobody in this room has to be taught how to worship. You know why? Because actually, all of us in this room are already worshiping. It's just not, it's not, I mean, how do we know this? We all have hearts. We all have desires. We all have preferences. And what that tells, what that reveals to us is that the real question here is not, can we learn how to worship? It's really a question of, where are you pointing your worship? If you say, well, you know, I, I, I don't know God, but therefore I don't worship, guess what? You actually are worshiping. You're worshiping in what your heart approves and seeks and craves after. Because ultimately that's what it means to, to, you know, in essence, lift your entire life up as God. What God is saying to us is, live with me, love me. You know, that's, that's all you got. Is if love is the greatest thing that we can do. And, and so it's, it's not a question of do, it, do I worship or can I worship? You're already, we're already worshiping. And, and the, the, the task that's before us is can we turn our desires and the thing that we run after, can we turn that to God and say, God, I belong to you? Because worshiping is something we are already doing. And this goes really for everyone whether we think we're worshiping or not. Really, the question is not whether we're worshiping, folks. It's really simple. Who are you worshiping? That's really the only question that we have. Right? This is why Jesus says this. He says, The good man brings good things out of the good stored in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart his mouth speaks. In other words, folks, you know, it's, it's whatever is inside, that's what you're going to worship. Whatever you desire inside, that you put inside, that's going to come, come right out. And so really, our worship really is a reflection of what we want to put inside, what we find pleasing, what we, you know, what we dream about. If you're one of those people, your dream is to win what is that, Super Lotto? Is that what it's called? Powerball, thank you. If your dream is to win the Powerball and you find yourself fantasizing about winning the Powerball, guess what? That's what you're worshiping. And God says, see what happens when you take that imaginary, creative life. See, God has given us a heart of creativity. All of us have hearts. All of us have, all of us have imaginations. And, and we tend to use it for everything but God sometimes, right? Because we say, oh, God, I've, I've done my worship. Now I'm going to do other things. And I can't wait to do the other things. 
God says, hey, slow down. Slow down. Just understand, wherever you go, your entire life, especially because we say we belong to Jesus, our entire life is worship. And really, it's, it's what we're going to do with that worship that's important and who we worship. So let me close today with just one closing question. One closing question for us. What picture of worship will you take with you today? Just take a moment. Just take a moment. Okay? Again, think about worship. What picture of worship will you take with you today? Moving forward, what can you imagine as worship from this day on in your life? and in the life that we share together here at Sturge. You know? what, what, what does that worship reflect? Who does that worship really glorify? What, who are we trying to please? Right? What is your picture of worship today? For me, the truth of the matter is that I used to have, once again, the, you know, as I said, the narrowest picture of worship. And, you know, I sometimes do. I still get sort of stuck with what I want. But what I will personally take away from me from today is the reminder that from Jesus, my life, my entire life, my entire life is worship. And yeah, I, I'm sort of scratching my head about that one, sort of, even now. You know, I don't know how that's really going to work out in my life. And frankly, I'm not even sure I want my entire life to be about worship because that's kind of, you know, kind of scary. You know, God, are you kidding? You're going to look at me and everything I do, you're going to look, in, you know, that's, it's supposed to be a worship. I mean, some of the things I do, and of course that, takes me back to what Jesus said, uh, you know, what, what, out of the goodness of the heart or out of the evil of the heart. So it's really both liberating, God saying, you, you can do this. Jesus is saying, you can do this. But at the same time, it's also challenging. You know, you can do this, but what's really in your heart? What, have you, what are you putting in your heart? So I'm going to ask you the same question. What, you know, what is the picture that we're going to take of worship as we go on today? I know that I'll probably screw up. <laughs> we all do. But the good news is, and this is sort of, sort of the mind-blowing aspect of the good news, Jesus says, your entire life is a worship to me. I want to invite you to, to so moving on, think of your life that way. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you know, think of God you know, standing with you and encouraging you, saying, your life is a worship. And, and, and let's start, therefore, to take it seriously. Let's think about lifting up worth and value to God. And I think if we do, that'll be really true worship. I pray that uh, uh, you will be blessed by this message. So let's recap. Uh, worship is the giving of worth or value and expresses what we find most valuable or satisfying. How to worship? It's basically our whole life. The way we worship should be our whole life. And I and just invite you to just consider that as we move on. Next, we're gonna, next week, we're going to talk about the foundation of worship. Which, and, and if you go ahead and read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 4. Uh, I want to just ask you to just continue to read along. But uh, for now, let's bow our heads and let us pray. And as we do, I want to invite the worshipers, uh, the worship team to come up and the ushers to come up as well. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to, to spend this time meditating upon what is worship. I ask, Lord God, that uh, you would put that, that picture, not a narrow picture, not a uh, self-reflective picture, but an expansive picture of who you are and how you have made us. And now you have really freed us to now explore a wide worship beyond uh, what maybe even makes us comfortable. And I ask, Lord God, that you would put that picture in our hearts moving forward. 
Lord, thank you for this day, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.